I spent about 20 years in the computer industry as a programmer, analyst, consultant. And even though I haven't been in that business in 15 years or so, I still like to keep my hand in technology. So a while back, I taught myself how to create and maintain websites to the point that now I have about 10 or 12 that I manage for a church, for some businesses and nonprofits and that sort of thing, a few hobby sites along the way. About a week ago, my email absolutely started blowing up with all of these warnings coming across that I had people trying to hack into my different websites. One of them was funny, the guy says, I've hacked your site and if you don't send me $2,000 in the next three days, then I'm gonna steal your data and make your life miserable. That was one of my hobby sites. I was thinking, dude, go ahead. I'll just delete it and start over again. What a mess. Now I know that my websites being attacked is a pretty small thing on a world scale. But I was thinking about this. Here we are in the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the majority of our world is pretty much in a lockdown state still. And yet there's still all kinds of evil going on in our world. And consider that there are still terrorists that are killing and maiming people in the Middle East. We read about the worst mass killing in Canadian history last month. Even here on the Big Island, a guy murdered his son down in the southern part of the island just a couple of weeks ago. And so in a very real sense, and this is our sermon title for today, Satan isn't staying at home. I want to talk to you about that today. Our text is going to be from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. And, and those of you that know the Bible pretty well, you're going, yep, that's where I would have gone. But I want to give you a little context so we understand where we are, because this passage is the very, very end of the book book of 1 Peter. And so how do we get to this point? Well, overall, Peter wrote this epistle to give encouragement to fellow believers during a time of persecution. And that thread runs along through the book. Now, just a little bit before we get to this passage, I want to look at chapter 4 and just touch on a few verses and then a couple in chapter 5, and it'll give you a good lead up to what we want to talk about today. Back in chapter 4, verse 7, Peter writes this, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And then a little bit further down, verses 12 and 13, he writes, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. So he's saying, guys, don't be surprised by all this that's going on around you. And then finally, the last verse of chapter 4, verse 19, reads this way, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. And then jumping over to chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, you probably know. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You may not be facing persecution right now, but the larger picture here is that we all are subject to the machinations and the schemes of Satan and his demons. And with that in mind, I'd like to jump right in to our text for today. Let me read these two verses, and then we'll go back and we'll, we'll break it up a little bit and, and try to explain how this impacts us. Peter writes, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. The command here is stark. I'll say it this way. Pay attention! He uses the words sober and vigilant. Now when we hear sober, we think not drunk. But consider the fact, and, and that is true, when you're not drunk, you're a couple of things, at least. One, you're alert. You know what's going on around you. And you're clear-headed. 
And so this first word that we translate as sober, he said, be alert, be clear headed. And might I also add clear eyed, keep an eye on what's going on. This word vigilant, I think, is a little more familiar to us in the 21st century. It's the idea of, of caution, of being watchful. Taken together, I'd like for you to think about guards on the wall. Consider the, the soldiers that are there in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, or the ones that are guarding the wall at Guantanamo Bay with Cuba all around them, or at any number of U.S. embassies around this world where the people just outside the gates hates the United States. That's the idea. He's saying you need to have your eyes peeled, your mind needs to be clear, and you need to be on guard all the time. Why? Why the need for this caution? Because Satan isn't staying at home. Let me read these, these words to you again, and then we're going to walk through them. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let me pause and say this. I generally get this sermon done um, sometime on Friday morning or Saturday morning at the least, at the latest. Well, I'm recording this later on Saturday afternoon. Um, it's been a bear to get this done. It just seems like there are just constant things getting in the way of me getting this message on tape for you. And, and I fully believe, and I don't want to over-spiritualize it, I mean sometimes things just happen, but I really don't think Satan wants me to share this with you folks today. And so uh, he is on all the time. When we rest, he's not resting. His imps, his demons, his followers, they're at it 24-7, 365. And so we have got to keep our eyes open. But there's a huge amount of information about Satan in these 15 words. He says, your adversary. That word that we have translated adversary originally meant an opponent in a lawsuit. Not your buddy, not somebody you're going to go out to coffee with. He's an enemy and he wants to crush you. He's called the devil. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew word where we get our name, Satan. The word means to slander or to falsely accuse. Consider the conversation that God had with Satan regarding Job back in Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Listen to this. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. Listen, and he will surely curse you to your face. Now, that's a false accusation. That's slander. And God's going to let Satan find out that that was a lie. That's who he is. He's also a murderer and a liar. And we see that actually over in the Gospel of John, Jesus himself speaking. In John 8, 44, he says, now he's, he's talking to the, to the Jewish leaders here, and so that's the you here. He says, you are, your, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Did you catch that? There is no truth in him. That's Jesus speaking, folks. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Take that to the bank. That's Jesus talking. Our adversary, the devil, and then it says, walks about like a roaring lion. Jesus elsewhere calls him the ruler of this world. And Paul refers to him as the prince of the power of the air. It's no wonder that Peter uses, though, the Im imagery of a roaring lion here. Because he's powerful. And I thought, well, what, is, what does a lion roaring even mean? So I went and looked at a few scientific sites. And here's what we're able to discern. Number one, the lion's roar is intimidating. It can be heard for up to five miles away. Isn't that 
a lot of the stock and trade of Satan is that he wants to intimidate us and, and, and cause us to, to go against what we would normally do, to, to, to bring us to a point of fear. The roar is also used to communicate with other lions. And maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but, but I just see the fact that uh, the satanic communication line is very, very good. And uh, their network is working overtime all the time, as I said before. Third, it's a reminder. When a lion roars, it's a reminder to those that are around and can hear that they're in his territory. And I think that so touches what we said before. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the ruler of this world. And so uh, we need to always remember that he's pretty much got the upper hand. God lets him have it, but he does have it. And I think it's interesting, too, it says he walks about. Satan's not in a hurry. Because, folks, let me tell you this. The world, the, the populated planet that we live upon, as far as he is concerned, is a target-rich environment. There are victims waiting everywhere for him to pounce. It says that he's seeking whom he may devour. I, I can't credit this. I tried to find it. I remember hearing it. I think it was a comedian that said it one time, talking about uh, being out in the Serengeti on a safari or whatever. And he said, you know what I noticed? Is that it's the animals that keep their heads down who are eaten. And I started to think about that, and that's so true when you watch those nature shows. Uh, you know, the, the, the lions and, and the other big cats are out there running around, and, and who are they going after? They're going after the animals that have their heads down, not paying attention. We have to stay vigilant. Remember that, and not let our guards down, because he's seeking whom he can destroy. He's always looking for the outliers. We, we've said it for so many years, I guess, in churches. We talk about in the pack, you know, that Satan's looking for that one that strays away, that sheep that strays away from the rest of the, the sheep, the lone rangers. And he preys on the unaware, the lackadaisical, the prideful, and yes, the gullible. And you say, well, I'm not gullible. I think a lot of this world is very gullible because they don't understand the spiritual warfare that's going on around them every single moment of every single day. They're not catching on to this. One, because they're not reading this, and that's where the problem starts. But just like those hackers that I was dealing with, he's looking for just a small crack in your firewall, some little point that you've not thought about, that you've disregarded, and that's where his crew is coming in. Jesus warned Peter about this. And remember now, Peter wrote this passage, and he's got some experience. And if you look over in Luke chapter 22, I want to read this to you, because uh, when Peter says, keep your eyes open, he knows what he's talking about. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. This is... This is the night before Jesus was crucified. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both through prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And then over in Matthew chapter 26, this is just a little bit later in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 41, Jesus, Jesus had gone there to pray and he had, he had brought along his inner circle and he'd go off and pray and come back and they were sleeping. And this happened a couple, three times. And he says to Peter in verse 41, 40 and then 41, he says, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. Peter's got some experience in Satan messing with him. And he wants to make sure that we understand this as well. You know, I'll tell you something about Satan, though. He'll look pretty innocent until it's too late.
2 Corinthians 11:14, Paul writes that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And so he can make sin look awfully nice. Let me ask you this. How many young lives have been ruined, not by some scruffy drug dealer or some greasy pimp, but a good-looking honor student who said, come on, nobody's going to find out. It's been said that Satan always oversells the temptation and undersells the consequences. So what's the answer to Satan's schemes? Well, it's right here in the text. Resist him. Resist him. Him. Did you see it there? That's the first two words in verse 9. Resist him. James writes the same thing over in James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Peter says we need to be steadfast in the faith. Right? Steadfast in the faith. What faith is he talking about? Our faith in Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 8 reads this way, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That manifested word may trip you up a little bit. This is the reason that Jesus came. This is the reason that he appeared on earth, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You say, but he's still doing stuff. Ultimately, Jesus wins. And Jesus can win in your life today. You don't have to wait till some time in the future. It's about calling on him. Remember, our faith in Jesus Christ. Paul writes about the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. And he instructs us in verse 16 that above all, to take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Jesus is not going to leave you alone to fend for yourself when the forces of Satan are lined against you. 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us that no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. As Paul writes in 2 Timothy, even when we're faithless, God is faithful. So imagine the power at your disposal when you're not faithless, but you are faithful, and God can take that and use it for His glory and His power. The last part of verse 9 actually echoes Paul's words here from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Did you see that? Because he says, resist him steadfast in the faith, and then these words come in knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. It's great to know that we're not out there alone. Yes, we always have the Holy Spirit leading us if we're followers of Jesus Christ. Yes, we always have Jesus' example. But to know that there are other believers around us and all over the place that are going through this thing as well. And you're not going to be the first person that's going to deal with whatever happens to be plaguing you in your life, maybe even right now. Other believers have gone through it before you. Maybe recently, maybe tens or hundreds of years ago. I don't know, but others have gone through it. Now, yes, some may have succumbed to the temptation. Some may have even lost their lives. But many more were victorious. And you can be as well. If you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you need to keep these verses in mind. And don't be discouraged. He is there to lead you and to guide you. He's given you His Word. He's given you His Spirit. He's given you other believers to be able to encourage you and help you through whatever you're going through. If you're not a Christian, you may be thinking, you know, I really don't see Satan causing a bunch of trouble. And you'd be right. That's because he's already got you. Bruce, that wasn't a very nice thing to say. It may not be, but it's true. You either belong to God or you belong to Satan. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've not accepted him as your Savior and Lord, you don't belong to God. You belong to Satan. You're on his team, so to speak. And he doesn't need to mess with you because he's got you. He's got other things to do. And by the way, let me, let me share this. 
I know people tend to have this idea that Satan's messing with them. It's probably not Satan. Satan is not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. He can't be all places at the same time. He is not God. He only can be at one place at one time. But he has got legions of demons that work with him. On top of that, he's got everybody in the human race that doesn't belong to Jesus Christ who some willingly and wittingly and others unknowingly are working with him. And, and it goes all up and down the spectrum of the human existence, all the way from, from people who uh, you know, are barely making it in life to people who are in the halls of government, passing laws that go against what God would call, call us to do. And so it's probably not going to be Satan. I feel like he's going to be chasing after somebody that's got a little more influence in the world. I, I, I don't think Satan has ever come knocking on my door personally. Honestly, I'm, I'm nobody. Uh, I figure he's bothering some big religious leader or some government leader or, or somebody like that. That's, that's who he's spending his time with unless he's just back at his office kind of running things. But there's a ton of evil in the world, the principalities and powers that it talks about in Scripture so often. So that being said, you say, you know, I, I, I just don't really experience that in my life. And, and by the way, if, if you know you're a follower of Jesus Christ and, and you're never feeling like you're in a, a spiritual battle, that's because probably you're not really doing God's will. And uh, again, Satan didn't have any problem with you because you're not stirring up anything. You start stirring up stuff, you're going to see his boys show up at your door regularly. And that goes for you who don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord as well. You start checking out the Bible. You start asking about Jesus. You think about going to church. You start calling up your Christian friends and asking questions. Get ready. Now there's a reason to come knocking on your door, and he's going to do it. Because he doesn't want you to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Satan is counting on you, if you're not a Christian, to be a part of his army. Because when you die and you leave this earth, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord, your destination is for a place called hell. That was designed for Satan and his imps, but you will be there as well. And Satan knows that he needs to gather together as large, as formidable an army as he possibly can. Because in the, in the end, there will be a final battle between good and evil. And he wants to be able to have as many with him as he possibly can. But let me just let you know this. It doesn't really matter whether Satan had a billion times 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 a billion soldiers in his army. All of them gathered together with whatever they can bring to bear will not defeat Jesus Christ. He is greater than all the powers of hell that could ever be assembled through all of earth's history. He is greater, and Scripture tells us he wins, and ultimately Satan is going to be defeated. And so you have to ask yourself the question, do you want to be part of that defeated army? Do you want to spend an eternity in hell, or would you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Because let me share this with you as we close. Jesus died so that you could have freedom from the power of Satan. You could have freedom from his program. Jesus came to this earth and he died on a cross for you and for me. Jesus was perfect and sinless and never, ever deserved to die on the cross. You and I who come onto this earth and we sin and we fall short of God's perfection all the time, we deserve to die for that. Jesus didn't. But Jesus came and died on that cross. And all who believe in him, all that believe that he died for humanity and that he rose again the third day, all who put their faith in Him and accept Him as their Savior and Lord and ask Him to forgive them for their sins, He will forgive and make part of His family. And Satan's not going to like you very much. And that's all right, because Jesus loves you. And so let me share with you this morning as we finish. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. He will empower you to battle against Satan. I've shared some of the, the ways that that can happen, and there's many other ways, but this is the core to help you in the battle. The world would like to think that there's no such thing as evil, at least in a spiritual sense. There's 
bad people and and sometimes it's whoever you vote against and all those sorts of things but but the world would like to think that we are essentially good people and that uh, you know everything's just sunshine and roses for the most part and it's just an accident when things happen bad there are forces at work because Satan is not staying at home Satan is out there trying to defeat trying to win trying to devour don't let him victimize you if you don't know Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord come to him today if you do but you've allowed him to have the upper hand, follow these directives and let Jesus be victorious in your life. Can we bow in prayer? Father God, I thank you for this time today to be able to share this message. Lord, and it's a tough message. Um, it's not a happy message necessarily, but it's one that needs to be said. And so Lord, for any that are there listening on the video today and and they would say, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, and, and I, I need to accept Him, and I, I need to do that today. Lord, I pray that they would join me in praying this simple prayer. Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've fallen short of Your holiness and perfection, and I ask You to forgive me for my sin. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and that you rose again the third day. And I confess you now as my Savior and my Lord. And I ask you to help me live for you and that you would live through me from this time forward. If you prayed that prayer, you are now a follower of Jesus Christ. You're now a child of God. Please don't let this be a one-time, one-off Thing. As a matter of fact, if you believe in your heart, that means there's going to be a change in you. All right? And so um, contact me, contact a believer that you know, get in a good church, get around people. Don't be that outlier. Don't be that lone ranger that I talked about in the sermon today. Become part of a Bible believing church and allow God to grow you and to protect you. Let me pray a second prayer for the believer. Father God, I pray for those who are. Uh, listening to this today that are followers of Christ and Lord perhaps they're they're going through some challenges now and maybe Satan's looking a little bigger than he needs to look in their lives right now and so Lord I pray that they would take the directives that Peter has given in this passage Lord and that they would um, call upon you to help them resist Satan and be strong in their faith Lord and and find other believers that to get around them and to and and so that there can be an encouragement there Lord God and that you would uh, just give them the victory over whatever battle that they're in now. Lord, if there's Christians listening to this and they really have come to the realization that they're not uh, feeling like there's any battle, Lord, I, I pray that you would show them in their hearts maybe why Satan is not having to mess with them too much. And Lord, that you would change their hearts and that you would help them to repent of whatever sin they have so that uh, they can get back in the battle again. And I thank you for that, Lord Jesus. May you lead us this week. Lord, I, I pray. We know that even though Satan roams, that Lord, you are running. And we praise you and thank you for that. And I pray that this world will seek you. And Lord, that we who are your followers would tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you go.